But there's, there's something so, I think, so ironic about how much we want to change, but we want to do it in a way that's as easiest as possible with the least amount of work. I mean, isn't that, isn't that the truth? I want to change everything about me, all my habits, but I don't want it to inconvenience me too much. I, I think that's where we find ourselves as a society. Because I think as a society, as we become more, really more busy, busier, if we, as we become busier and we become more involved, I really think we become more disjointed. And, and we become so overwhelmed with possibilities and dreams and goals that we really have to set out a set of priorities. The idea of a priority is that which comes before everything else. It's that which is most important to you. It's that which in the end you are going to be the most invested with your free time. And even your, your time at work, this might be the one thing you're working toward. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having priorities. In fact, I think it is very important for us to have priorities. Uh, because it gives us a definition of what success is, what failure is. It helps us achieve our goals. When we can boil our lives down to one objective, I think it helps everything become clear. So here's what I want you to do. If you have a sheet of paper... If you have a pen, you might grab one of those cards in front of you. I want you to just take just a second. I want you to boil your life down to one objective. Just one. Now, don't cheat off of what your spouse is writing down. Okay, what your kids are writing down to you. What do you think as an individual is your primary priority? I'll give you just a second. I hear some whispering. Are you asking for help? What is your number one priority? See, while you're writing, I think if we went to the mall, you go to Victoria Gardens, Ontario Mills, whatever mall you'd like to go to, Montclair, and I were to get a sheet of paper and a pen, and I just stood there at the entrance and as people came in I would say would you please just for a minute fill out uh, this questionnaire and there's only one question what is your number one priority I think we'd get a lot of answers I really do I think we get a lot of interesting answers especially depending on which mall you're at we might get a wide variety of what people consider to be important but when it comes to being a child of God there can only be one priority above everything else, above our new investment, our losing weight, our tidying up, our decluttering, whatever the case is. There, there has to be one priority above everything else. I think about what David wrote in the Old Testament in Psalm 27 verse 4. He said, one thing, one thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I shall seek. You think about how a single focus like that can help you in your life. Not, not two things, not five things, not 20 things. David said, there's only one thing I ask from God above all else, and there's only one thing that I seek. Then I think about in the New Testament when Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, this one thing I do. Again, Paul, he, he spends a lot of time in Philippians 3 about his past, about his background, about his occupation, things that he had done. And then he said, I counted all this rubbish compared to this one thing. This morning I want us to look at a tale of two sisters. I want us to look at a sister who, while she had a great idea, it soon became such an overwhelming experience that she lost focus. It brought about such an anxiety that she began to lash out at those she loved. And it distracted her from her number one priority. Meanwhile, the other sister had her priorities in check. You know how I know that? 
Because later on in this passage, Jesus said one thing is necessary. Do you want to know what that one thing is? You know, if Jesus Himself, if the Lord God of heaven, your Savior, your Redeemer, and your friend said, there are a lot of many things that can cause you trouble, but one thing is necessary. I think it would be important for us to listen to hear what's necessary. So let's look together. Let's look at Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. And we're going to talk about a distracted devotion. Do you have your Bibles with you? Let's look together. Beginning in verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve Alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered him, her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So let's think about this time to listen. Going back to verse 38, you know, time is running out for Jesus. This is the end game of Jesus' life. This is the point in which he begins walking toward Jerusalem. We're in the last few months. Between chapter 10, verse 38, until 1928, Jesus is on a journey. A journey that's going to ultimately lead him to his destiny of rejection, shame, torment, and execution. There aren't a whole lot of miracles in this section, but there are a lot of teaching moments, and I find that interesting, that toward the end of Jesus' life, he spent more time teaching and less time healing, because he had a message he wanted to be received by those who came to him. So in this journey, he comes to a certain village we know from the Gospel of John, That's the village of Bethany. And here's something also interesting. Is that this account, these few verses of this this story, they're not found any other gospel. It's unique to Luke, and I think it is of the utmost importance for us to listen to what Luke wrote down. Because he comes up to this certain village, the village of Bethany, and he's greeted by Martha. Now, this is the same Martha related to Mary and also to Lazarus. And when it says that she received him, when she welcomed him, that's more than just a greeting. That was an understanding of an embrace and a promise to both entertain and to protect every visitor who came underneath her roof. We understand that Martha most likely was the older sister since she took the responsibility to greet Jesus and to bring him in to her house. And so what she's doing is when Jesus came to the door, she opened the door and she welcomed him in and she made a promise to take care of him and to protect him until he left his house. This was the understanding of hospitality in the first century. So far, so good, right? Jesus goes to the village and out of all the homes, of all the houses he could have gone to, he goes to her. He goes to her house. And you know what happens? She opens the door. She invites him inside. I think that's pretty good so far. I think she has her priorities straight. Doesn't she? How many of us in here would see Jesus coming and close the the blinds? Lock the door? Uh, Not today, Jesus. Maybe another day. Let me get my life together first. Let me declutter a little bit. And then I'll have you come into my house. No. No. In fact, later she calls him Lord, demonstrating that she's a believer, a devout member of of his teaching. So she received him. And then we see Jesus, we see Martha, we see Martha's sister, Mary. I want you to notice her description. What do we know about her? What do we know about her hair color, her eye color, 
Does Scripture tell us if she was a little bit more solemn or she's really cheerful? If she liked to tell jokes? What was her favorite animal? You know, Scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot about Mary and Martha. In fact, you could take everything Scripture tells us about the two and put it on one sheet of paper. Because Scripture didn't deem it necessary for us to know all these traits about Mary and Martha. But the one thing that is recorded for our learning is what Mary does as soon as Jesus enters the house. I want you to notice what is occurring. She sits at his feet and she listened to his teaching. Now, in this day and age, whenever a teacher, whenever a rabbi was ready to teach, he would take a certain position. He would get either to a chair or a rock or even on the ground and he would sit. And this signified that it was time for you to learn. So you imagine almost this mad rush of everybody coming around and sitting down at his feet. Have you ever heard that expression before, to sit at the feet of somebody that you might learn from them? Well, that's what Mary does. Imagine all these people that could be there to listen. Here is Mary as close as possible wanting to learn. Now, this was a revolutionary concept because rabbis did not allow women to sit at their feet. If they were even allowed to learn at all, they had their own section where they had to make sure that all the men were able to learn first and get as close as possible. And they were supposed to come in afterward, but not Mary. Mary had such a desire to draw close to Christ that she risked the criticism, the judgment, the eye rolls, the muttering and the whispering so that she could be near Jesus. Mary had one goal, one priority, to seek Christ, to learn from Him, to follow Him. That's what Mary is doing in this passage. And I think about the idea of seeking the Lord, of even calling Him Lord. Do you remember just earlier in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 48, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do what I tell you to do. Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them. Now I want you to notice that formula. First of all, you have to come to Jesus. Second, you have to learn from Jesus. But third, you have to do what Jesus says. Everyone who comes to me and hears me and does what I teach, I will show you like what he is. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation of the rock. When a flood rose and the stream broke against the house, it could not shake it because it had been well built. Jesus said, you need to build a foundation that can handle the storms. How do you build that foundation? You come to me, you hear what I have to say, and you do it. And that's what Mary did. Mary learned to listen when Jesus taught. Then we get to the next verse. We see a time of distraction. But Martha. You know when you read that word, really that phrase, but Martha, something bad's about to happen. Something is about to shatter the serenity of, of the scene that we have before us of Jesus teaching and Mary sitting at his feet and drawing as close as she can to him so that she might hear what he has to say. But Martha was distracted. By what? Too much serving. Now think about, but before we start laughing at Martha or, or, or condemning Martha, I want you to think about her situation. First, imagine God himself at your dinner table. Have you ever been nervous making a dinner for anybody? Making sure you got everything cooked just right or nothing is, is too dry, everything just turns up. Imagine if that's Jesus at your dinner table. Second, Jesus didn't travel alone. At the least, Jesus had his 12 Disciples, his closest followers with him. And then when you go back to the beginning of Luke chapter 10, 
He had appointed 72 disciples to go out to the communities and spread the news about the kingdom of God. And then later on in the chapter, before we get to verse 38, all 72 come back. So Jesus might have had his 12 and then his entourage. He might have had everybody there. So when Martha opens up the door, she might be looking out at a crowd. And Jesus is in the center. When Jesus is in the center, she, she welcomes him in, which means she also welcomes in everybody else. What's the largest number of people you've ever served in your house? Have you served 80? 85? 100? That's what Martha was having to do right now. So you can imagine as she's trying to get everything together, as she's trying to serve, as she's trying to fulfill the obligation of what the owner of a house has to do to be hospitable toward their guest, she looks over and she sees her sister not helping at all. See, the problem wasn't the fact that she was serving. I think that's sometimes when we read this passage, we think, oh, it was just awful that she was serving. No, in fact, Jesus wrote and Jesus told his disciples, as we see God inspiring Mark to write, but whoever would be great among you must be what? Your servant. So she was fulfilling the responsibility, and she was following the teaching of the master. The problem wasn't the serving. It was the distraction that was brought about by the serving. But Martha was distracted. The word distracted means to pull away. It means to not only drag down, but to drag around. That she allowed the worldly to influence her more than the godly. While she had a desire to learn, she had become distracted by the worldly things and had not devoted herself to the teachings of Christ. And it all came to a point when she began to blame Mary. You know, her twisted priorities, you know what the consequence of her twisted priorities were? She began to grow anxious. Do you struggle with anxiety? Do you struggle with stress? Sometimes that stress is brought about by a mistaken priority. Martha had a mistaken priority and it caused her to feel anxious. And in her anxiety and her stress, she grew frustrated and she lashed out at both her sister and her Lord. Now notice again, she's a believer. She starts by saying, Lord. And you think, oh, this might be good. No. Because the next phrase is an indictment. Lord, do you care? Lord, do you not care? That my sister has left me to serve alone? Lord, don't you care? Have you ever asked that of God before? God, don't you care? And it wasn't even about her. It wasn't, God, don't you care that you brought too much responsibility into my house? No, it was, God, don't you care that my sister is not serving, is not being responsible? Maybe that's been our prayer. God, don't you care that brother so-and-so isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing? That sister so-and-so isn't serving the way she should? Don't you care? And then she turns that question into a command. How graceless of a host she was. She said, God, Lord, Master, tell her to help me. Does that sound like Jesus was her Lord at that point? No. She placed herself above God. Now, thinking about her situation. Some of us might have been in a similar situation before. Some of us might be encouraging Martha. Right on, Martha. You tell that lazy sister of yours to get up and help. Doesn't scripture say somewhere if a man does not work, let him not eat? Yeah, you're in the right, Martha. Before we condemn Martha, let's look at our own lives for a minute. Let's think about how many times a week do we read the Word of God? 
How many times a week do you pray? How many times a week are non-priorities placed above the upward call of seeking Jesus and living a godly life? What commitment do you think kept people home instead of coming to worship today? How many non-priorities prohibit us from serving God, from seeking God, from gathering with brothers and sisters whenever there's an opportunity? What causes us to be so busy that we can't attend a, a class or a worship service? You know, our lives can be so full of the unnecessary Yet it is those things that are unnecessary that both control us and ruin us. Let's continue on with the story. See, there's a time to choose. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. I love the comfort in Jesus' voice. He had the ability to cause storms to stand still. He had the ability to call dead men back to life. And he used his authority not to lash out in response, but in a sympathetic rebuke. Martha, Martha. It reminds me when Jesus is talking to the rich young ruler, and there comes a point in their discussion where Jesus looked at him. Scripture describes that he loved him. We see that love and patience in Jesus in this verse. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Martha, there are a lot of things occupying your time. Martha, you are disturbed. You are overwhelmed. You are fretting about concerning things that just don't really matter. But one thing is necessary. One thing is above everything else. Now this is where Jesus begins to rub the salt into the wound, okay? Because he says, Mary, that's her sister. Imagine that sibling rivalry. Mary has chosen the good portion. Literally, Mary has chosen the best portion. It's a superlative And what Jesus is saying is you're so focused on all these things that are bringing you so much grief, so much frustration, so much agitation. Yet your sister, she has chosen but one thing. And she chose the best thing. And I'm not about to take that away from her. We don't know Martha's response. We don't know what Mary had to say. Or how the crowd mumbled or muttered. All we know is what Jesus believed to be the most important. Jesus said he would not punish those whose priorities were correct. Church, I think this morning, each and every one of us has a little bit of Martha's spirit in us that we need to root out. I believe it. See, I have to ask myself the question, what are the things that distract me the most at the cost of something crucial to my spiritual state. Because I remember something else that Jesus said. And he was teaching me when he said this, that if my priorities are misplaced, I will never find peace. When he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, he didn't end there at verse 33. He said, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. At the end of our lives, we won't remember how much weight we lost in 2019. We won't remember how many cupboards we cleaned out. We won't even remember that car that we bought. We won't even remember that family vacation we took that weekend. 
at the end of our lives, though? Will Jesus told us, tell us that we sought the best portion or that we had allowed the world to distract us from seeking him? Because what I remember in Scripture is that Jesus taught me that if I seek him first, I will be satisfied. I will have peace. And he will provide. I also remember learning in Scripture that if I seek the world, I will only be disappointed. And I'll only be agitated. And I'll only find anxiety. Because at the end of my life, I will remember something Jesus said. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Are you devoted today? Are you distracted from your devotion? Let your one priority be that you will seek Christ, that you will hear him and you'll do what he says. Because I promise you today that if you seek Jesus, you will be satisfied. But if you allow the world to overwhelm you, you'll always be anxious. You'll always be disappointed. So look at that sheet of paper that you wrote down your ultimate priority earlier this morning. Is it to seek Jesus? Or do we need to change our priorities? If you need anything this morning, if you need to become a child of God, make that your first priority. To be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away, be made new. If you are a child of God this morning and you've allowed yourself to be distracted, why not make things right in 2019? You need to seek Jesus so that you can be satisfied. If you need anything at all, come now while we stand and while we sing.